Hello everyone and thank you to tuning in to UTP Presents. I am Farzan Faramazi and I will be your host today. My guest today is a political analyst and freelance journalist writing primarily about Iran domestic and foreign affairs. He is also the co-author of the book Iran and the United States, an insider's view on the failed path and the road to peace, published in May 2014. My guest today is Shahir Shahid Saleh. Welcome to UTP Presents, Shahir. Thank you. So, uh, first, congratulations on your book. Thank and you so, to start the show, would you please introduce yourself? Well, as you said, I'm a political analyst and a freelance journalist. I write predominantly about Iran's foreign policy and domestic politics uh, with the focus on Iran-U.S. relations. That's what I do. Okay, so you are, uh, you're from Iran, you're Iranian and live in Canada. So how did you end up here in Boise, Idaho? Well, actually what happened is that I was invited by uh, American Committee on Foreign Relations uh, to deliver a presentation about uh, uh, Iran-U.S. relations as viewed from Tehran. That's why I'm here. Okay. Uh, so welcome to Boise. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. So let's start talking about uh, this book uh, jointly written by you and Mr. Musavian. So what's it about? Can you give us a preview about your book? Well, actually the the book uh, 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 is a study about, in-depth study about uh, the conflict between Iran and the United States, but mainly it focuses on uh, the, um, the misperception as one of the root causes of uh, the conflict between these uh, two countries. And we believe that uh, these uh, two countries, uh, these two systems, uh, they don't understand each other. And that's why uh, there is lots of uh, misanalysis both in Tehran and Washington about uh, the, the political situation in uh, the, the other country. And that's why uh, this has caused actually a, a, a Gordian knot in the relations between these two countries. Here we introduce the two systems to each other so that they know each other, mainly the United States to Iran as uh, the, the conflict is viewed uh, from Tehran. So how do you see the uh, US and Iran's relationship? So they, these two countries, they don't have any relationship. Is that true? Well, the uh, former relationships, of course, uh, they don't have any, but uh, uh, what they call it in international relations, uh, track two activities. It means uh, the um, relationship bet between the former diplomats and the uh, politicians and scholars. This has been going on for years, especially in the last six, seven years. Uh, they have been working behind the scenes uh, uh, track to activists and uh, then uh, the outcome of that was uh, uh, the emergence of uh, track one policy which uh, today you see between um, uh, John Kerry, Jabhat Zarif and at uh, the highest level of uh, the, the politicians of the two countries. So you believe in there is a, some sort of hidden relationship is going on? Well, actually, it's not a hidden relationship. It's an uh, is, uh, exchange of ideas and an effort to uh, fix uh, this situation and uh, to bring this uh, conflict uh, to an end. It's not a relationship. It's uh, more about, as, as I said, uh, exchange of uh, uh, views between the, the track to activists. So, uh you, you mentioned that uh, you, you work as a freelance journalist and you have uh, written articles for Al Monitor, Al Sharq Al Osad, Asia Times, Gulf News, Money Morning, and etc. So, what does it look like to be a freelance journalist? How do you describe that? <laughs> well, uh, it has uh, its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, when you are a freelance, so you are not uh, limited to, to work with a uh, with one organization, you are free to uh, choose uh, your, your own uh, topics and subjects. But on the other hand, uh, to, to be honest with you, uh, uh, financially, <laughs> you go up and down because one month you do very well, uh, the, because uh, you can write uh, several articles, the next month uh, uh, maybe the, nothing happens. So uh, it's not steady financially, the, the, the profession, but uh, you have uh, 
uh, you don't have uh, the, so much limitations as uh, a journalist who works for, a, for an organization. Uh, so your articles and now this book are mainly about politics. Uh, do you consider yourself a politician? No, not at all. Actually, I'm a political analyst and uh, I, I'm not a politician and I'm not a political activist. So I've never been. I mean, I'm a political analyst. So uh, speaking of politics, on, on August 2000, uh, 21st, in an article published in Iran Review website written by yourself and Mr. Musavian, you talked about Israeli and Palestinian conflict and especially talked about Palestinian rocket capability. So you, write, uh, you wrote that, uh, quote, it is an open secret that this capability is now indigenous. Uh, do you mean they can make rockets like the Palestinians? Yeah, the, the, the information that we have, I mean, me and Mr. Musavian, uh, is that they can make some sort of rockets there, mainly Fajr 5, Fajr, Fajr Panj in, in Farsi. They can make them there, and uh, the technology is given by uh, IRGC, uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guard. So, but the public understanding is Iran gives the rockets to them, and they have a hard time maintaining those, those tunnels in Palestine, like Hamas having a hard time maintaining those tunnels under the 24-7 surveillance of Israeli secret service. So how could it be possible that they can make rockets in Palestine? Well, th that, to be honest with you, I don't know, <laughs> because uh, it is uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, is uh, 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 so much uh, secret things going on that uh, I don't know about that. I don't have any answer for that. I don't know. Uh, so speaking of Hamas and uh, Palestine, and so what do you think about Hamas and Hezbollah? As, as you may know, according to the U.S. Department of State, they are on the foreign terrorist organization list. Do you agree with them being on the list, on this list? Well, actually, the, I believe that uh, they have done something in the past, uh, especially uh, not uh, allegedly uh, they have done something because it's not proven, especially in the case of Hezbollah, uh, the bombings in, in Beirut, uh, that, um, you know, it, it uh, the, the inflicted a huge damage uh, to uh, the, the American troops there. Uh, but I believe at this point, uh, especially Hezbollah, uh, they have uh, completely abandoned that uh, the, 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 their behavior uh, from the past. And uh, we know that the uh, United States uh, revises the situation of organization because now they are heavily engaged in uh, political processes in Lebanon. For example, uh, the MKO, Mujahideen Khal from Iran, they were in the terrorist list uh, for years. And then the uh, United States uh, just uh, uh, remove them from the list, uh, I guess, um, a year and a half ago. So they can revise it, especially when it comes to Hezbollah. I think that it's a political party at this point, although they, must, uh, they might have done, you know, some allegedly terrorist uh, uh, activities in the past. About Hamas, Hamas, again, uh, they, they have done uh, terrorist activities uh, the, uh, in the past, but you know, it's a matter of uh, perception. One sees them as freedom fighters. The other one is, uh, says that they are terrorists. Uh, to this point, uh, there is no um, consensus on the definition on terrorism. But like two or three days ago, it was an attack to a synagogue in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Like six or seven people died of that. So how do you define terrorism on that? Well, actually, the, uh, to be honest with you, if you put yourself on the other side, uh, they say uh, that uh, this, uh, there is a long history of oppression uh, and occupation behind this. It, this hasn't happened overnight. So they say that uh, now you know that uh, Mr. Netanyahu says they wanted to destroy the houses in, in uh, uh, they call it Beit al uh, the, the others yeah. call it uh, Jerusalem, and uh, the Palestinian houses. So this, this is not an isolated event. The, the, there is a history behind it. And that's why I say it, it depends on uh, the, the uh, perception of the people. One says terrorists and the other one says it's freedom fighter. And um, it's not up to me to judge, but uh, uh, both sides, uh, they have their own arguments. 
So after the, the attack happened in Senegal two or three days ago, as you said, Mr. Netanyahu uh, mentioned that they would react to this uh, terrorist attack. Of course. So should we anticipate another war? No, I don't think so, because uh, whom they wanted to attack. Uh, the, 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 before, I mean, uh, two, three months ago, it was about uh, uh, rockets coming from Gaza. But, but this time, uh, they wanted to attack who? I mean, uh, unless they get into a new fight with, with, with uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority, that I uh, see it very unlikely. Okay, so, so are you optimistic about the ceasefire and peace between Israel and Palestine? For a long term, I, I think uh, I, you know, here is the thing: recognition of Israel uh, from Hamas side, and that is very unlikely because religiously they cannot do that. And, and Israel it, consider them as a terrorist, like Hamas. <laughs> well, that, that that they can resolve between themselves. But what I am saying is that um, religiously they cannot recognize Israel. Because if they do that, they will lose all their uh, grassroots supporters and the, the, their position among uh, the Palestinians. What they can do is, and uh, this is what they have uh, uh, been doing uh, in early years of uh, uh, the emergence of Islam, uh, they can agree on a truth, on a very long truth, 20 years, 30 years. This is what at the very early years of Islam they were doing with the enemies of uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad. So uh, I, I guess that uh, they will come to this conclusion finally, that this is uh, the first step, to go for a truth because the two sides are um, uh, both tired of this situation and the, the, this is um, a Gordian knot that uh, uh, should be untied at uh, some point. So what you're suggesting here is they have to seek for an uh, argument, an agreement basically, on religious level first, second, political level. Yes, definitely. Otherwise, you know, the, the, there must be a, a religious justification for their move. There is no doubt about it. Okay, so let's come back to your book. Uh, what's your opinion uh, on the nuclear uh, talks between Iran and the P5 plus 1 group? And it's still, this is something ongoing process right now. <laughs> so in, in what sense? So have you seen any, like, uh, uh, have you seen any development in nuclear talks since uh, right, new right. president Hassan Rouhani took the office? So obviously, yeah, the, I mean, the, this uh, uh, Geneva interim agreement was, was a huge step forward. And about uh, the, the outcome of the talks, I, I, I think uh, that uh, before uh, November 24th, they will come to um, another and annex to the previous uh, uh, agreement that uh, they will move forward a uh, uh, few steps. Uh, Iran will accept uh, some more uh, the limitations. For example, they, this is what I have heard, that uh, they have uh, come uh, to some sort of agreement about Iraq uh, reactor. And uh, they have come uh, to some sort of agreement about in inspections. Maybe they introduce it into a new agreement. Some uh, sanctions uh, will be removed, and then uh, they will uh, set a new deadline, which logically it should be before uh, the, the, uh, the, the new uh, Congress commences its uh, new session in, uh, on January 3rd. So, but the sanction still remains on Iran, so. Well, what, what Obama can do, as you know, uh, he can uh, waive, up to this point, he can waive uh, most of the sanctions, I mean the majority of the sanctions, and uh, that, that gives a chance uh, for confidence building. You know, after two years, uh, three years, nobody wants uh, to go back to square one and again start that hostile uh, the, uh, relationships. So I believe that if, if Obama waves, because he can waive uh, uh, most of them, the most uh, um, dangerous uh, the sanctions uh, for Iran. And then after two, three years, they can um, ask the Congress, because you know that uh, uh, the president should certify uh, in front of the Congress that uh, they are not supporting terrorism and also about the human rights because these two issues also are somehow linked to the nuclear issue. 
And I don't see any reason after uh, the two, two, three years, Iran, if Iran uh, actually um, uh, goes by the rules and agreements, uh, the, the, there is no reason all of a sudden the, the, the Congress uh, says that we don't to accept, have, to have yeah, we don't accept the, 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 to lift the sanctions. I don't see that. And, and so speaking of sanctions and talking about sanctions, so do you uh, think like sanctions is like a war on Iranian people? Like they more affect Iranian people rather than Iranian government? What do you think about that? Well, actually, the, at the very beginning, if you remember, they said that, that uh, we wanted to impose uh, targeted sanctions. And uh, they, they were talking about sanctions uh, that uh, were targeting just uh, the government. But all of a sudden, things changed. And as you say, uh, it now um, targets everybody, the whole nation. And, uh, but if you put yourself in American shoes, I mean, what can they do uh, if the sanctions are not serious? And uh, they are not biting the, the the system. Then, then you know they won't uh, react. Maybe as they do now. So both sides have their own. The Iranian go government says that you know these sanctions, as you say, Hassan Rouhani has repeatedly said, this is against the uh, the people of Iran. He is right. And the other side said, what are we supposed to do? I mean, if if we we don't do that, then how can we stop you? So each of them, they have their own arguments uh, and um, uh, to some extent valid. So uh, talking about uh, President Hassan Rouhani, uh, how do you evaluate uh, President Rouhani both on domestic and foreign policy? If you want to like, give him a grade, what would you give him out of 20? Uh, you know, domestically, he hasn't done anything, uh, Hassan Rouhani, and there is a very good reason for that. Because Rouhani's, uh, at, the, at the top of uh, Rouhani's agenda is uh, resolving uh, the nuclear issue. So he doesn't want uh, to open a new front with his opponents inside the country until this issue is resolved. Therefore, uh, I, I say that uh, it's not fair to say, uh, to give him a, a low mark for, for the, uh, the, his domestic policy because he, he's not actually uh, concentrating on that at this time. But foreign policy, I can say out of 20, considering the, his opponents and the, their activities and how they wanted to st stop him, uh, I, I would say um, I give him um, 18 out of 20 18 out under of the circumstances. <laughs> And what is and what are those circumstances? Well, as I said, I mean, the, the, he has uh, he has uh, the supreme leader in front of him, okay. and um, you know that the supreme leader is not very happy uh, with the, the uh, negotiations. He says uh, that uh, I'm uh, pessimistic about it. He has uh, several times intervened, and uh, the, uh, you know uh, he stopped negotiations uh, with the Americans and the Western countries. And he has uh, the, the security elite. They are against this. Uh, the, he has uh, people from army and uh, high-ranking uh, clerics. So they, are, you know, they, don't, they don't like what he does. But uh, uh, despite all these uh, uh, opposition, I mean, the, he's uh, just uh, pushing the, uh, the negotiations forward, which is very, very... So uh, you mentioned Hassan Rouhani is like, the first priority for him is now the foreign policy and foreign affairs. And then he, after that, when he gains something that he is looking for, he wants to work on a domestic affairs. Do you think that's fair to Iranian people who voted for him and they had hope for change, of course? Well, you have to be, you have, uh, to be logical. I mean, if, if he wants uh, to open a new front inside the country, talk about uh, freedom and you know, uh, the social liberties and things like that, uh, the, the whole system uh, will turn against him. And uh, that uh, defeats the whole purpose, which was uh, resolving the issue of uh, uh, the, the, the nuclear uh, crisis. So, uh, to be fair, uh, logically, you have to think that uh, if he opens a new front inside the country, th uh, then uh, the, he cannot uh, work. Uh, and at the same time, he has to negotiate with the supreme leader. He has to negotiate uh, with the, uh, uh, the security apparatus at the same time a negotiator with the foreigners uh, in order to strike a deal. If he uh, just uh, changes course, 
and uh, that also the, will be completely the sidelined, the, uh, the nuclear issue. So you mentioned earlier about the human rights and the human rights are kind of linked to nuclear uh, issues with Iran. So how President Rouhani, how does he handle the uh, human rights? Like for example, we have Ponche Kawami, she went to the stadium to watch a volleyball game and now she's in prison. We have Baha'is in Iran, they cannot go to universities. We have other minorities. So what's, uh, how does he wants to handle these human rights? And why not the, the world powers such as US and the European nations, they don't put enough pressure on Iran about the human rights, but they do more, put more pressure on Iran about the nuclear program. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of uh, the human rights is more a foreign policy tool uh, rather than a, a, a reality in the foreign policy of uh, the Western countries. For example, the, uh, one of the biggest violators of uh, human rights in the world is uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the government of Saudi Arabia. Do they say a word about it? Nothing. So human rights is a foreign policy tool. When they wanted to topple Bashar Assad, they bring it up. When they want to topple uh, Saddam Hussein, they bring it up. Gaddafi bring it up in the case of Iran. But uh, when you're talking about Jordan, I mean, look at Jordan. Nobody can talk. So go to Saudi Arabia, go to United Arab Emirates. They are all Western allies. But no one talks about uh, violations of human rights in those countries. So there is no essence in this other than a, a, a foreign policy tool. Now, what Hassan Rouhani can do is, Hassan Rouhani's school of thought is this, that if we improve relations with the West, the uh, democracy will gradually develop in the country because the system is not threatened by the Western countries. Because they are not threatened by the United States and the Western countries, they gradually start to open up the, the, the system inside of the country. And more than likely, the world powers would stop talking about human rights issues. Oh, definitely, for sure, for sure. Because uh, the, right now, uh, we know that uh, the, the regime, regime change uh, is in action. <laughs> but at that point, obviously, they want to talk about it. As I told you, I mean, look, look at Saudi Arabia. Look at the, uh, the situation of women there. Why nobody talks in, in the U.S. about that? Because human rights is a foreign policy too. Okay, so you wrote uh, several articles about green movement in Iran yeah. um, a few years ago. So why, at that time, why uh, U.S. and the world powers, they didn't help Iranian people to overthrow the government? Um, that's a very good question. Um, actually, in this book, um, uh, we have gone through this uh, um, in details. That movement was not about people uh, against the government. That movement was, uh, uh, realistically, was people against people. Mod oh, modern, yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to just ex <laughs> explain. It was, it was modernity against a tradition, modernists against a traditionalist. If you remember, in one of the statements that uh, the Musavian, the defeated uh, candidate uh, camp uh, issued, they said that, that the real number of votes uh, are 24 million for Musavian and 12 million for Ahmadinejad. They said the, they, were, they had manipulated the numbers. Just take these numbers at face value. So it means that the system at that point had 12 million votes at least. Why I say at least? Because many of them also might have uh, voted for Mus Musavi, because Musavi at that point was, was approved uh, by the Guardian Council, right? Yeah. So 12 million supporters were there. So this movement was not the whole country uh, against the government. But Iran has 60 million population. 12 well, million is not a huge number. No, it's not. But uh, look at the, the, the votes in, in the best uh, uh, democracies in the world. Obama, 30%. 
30% bring the pre president uh, to office. It's, it's not more than that. 30% of uh, 70 million is, is what, uh, tw uh, 20 million people. No, but what I'm saying is that definitely those numbers must have been exaggerated by Musavi. I mean, logically, must have been exaggerated. And don't forget that all these protests and demonstrations were concentrated in Tehran. And actually in Tehran, although the, the um, election was rigged, Musavi could beat Ahmadinejad in Tehran. Did you know that? So the, the votes of Musavi in Tehran was more than Ahmadinejad even in that election. So Tehran was at the heart of this demonstration and protest, not other cities, because Tehran is um, where middle and high class uh, the people in terms of income, they are concentrated. And they, they love uh, Western culture, and they, they don't like the system. That's the, where all these opposition is concentrated. It's all about Tehran, and of course, uh, to a degree, larger cities. Okay, so uh, my final question is, as a journalist, what's your advice or recommendation to young people interested in journalism? I, I guess that uh, they should be brave to express uh, their ideas. And if they do that, and also uh, not necessarily be uh, contrarian, but not go with the, this is my opinion, not go with the flow and say same things that everybody else says. Go deep into the, uh, the, the issues and then um, be brave to express your ideas. Well, thank you so much, Shahir yeah, Shahid well. Salas. And a special thanks to Frank Church Institute. That's all the time that we have for today. Uh, until next time, have a wonderful day.